The son of Italian immigrants, Louis Zamperini was born in 1917. Soon after, his family moved from New York to the West Coast, and Torrance, California inherited quite a character. I couldn't speak English, so I'm in kindergarten, and uh, the, the only reason I got to the first grade is because I cheated. <laughs> a smoker by age five, Louis was a tough young man. The kids started teasing me to get me to swear in Italian. Two or three months and I started retaliating, and I found out I could whip these guys. And so I was always fighting, getting even, and even the girls in school, when they gave me trouble, I'd, I'd take a clove of garlic and chew it and then blow my breath out of them <laughs> in school. And uh, so my whole life became a life of, of, of getting even. His favorite trick? Stealing beer from bootleggers. He was such a menace, the police intervened. My brother and the, and the chief of police and the principal got together and said, what are we going to do with this kid? Thinking he could use his speed for something besides stealing, they talked him into track. His first race? In a 660-yard run, and I came in last, and of course I suffered because I'd been smoking and hijacking booze, and I was in lousy shape, and ah, oh, I never suffered so much in my life. A slow start, but in 1934, Louis broke the world's interscholastic mile record. His time of four minutes, 21 seconds, stood for two decades. And then I got the shock of my life. I got a call from the Olympic Committee that I had qualified for the Olympic tryouts. The Torrance Tornado finished the 5,000 meter Olympic trials in a dead heat and qualified for a place on the American Olympic team. Louis was off to Berlin, the capital of Nazi Germany. I gained uh, about 10 or 12 pounds on the boat going across. <laughs> this is during the Depression, so, and this is all free food. In the 5,000 meter Olympic final, Louis finished eighth, but ran the last quarter mile in just 56 seconds. So fast that Adolf Hitler himself insisted on meeting him. So I went over to see him and he uh, just reached down and shook my hand, kind of flimsy-like and just said, ah, the boy with the fast finish. The boy with the fast finish went on to star at USC and ran the mile in four minutes, eight and three tenths seconds, an NCAA record for 15 years. He hoped for another shot at Olympic gold in 1940, but the games were canceled due to the war. Louis joined the military. Well, I ended up in the Army Air Corps and uh, in the Pacific, operating out of uh, Kahuku Field in Hawaii. Over the next two years, he earned the nickname Lucky Louie for cheating death as a bombardier. So the search and rescue mission on May 27th of 43 should have been routine. And the only plane available was a Green Hornet, which was green. <laughs> the plane was, it was used for salvage, salvaging parts from it. Uh, it couldn't go on a mission because it couldn't carry a bomb load. And we were reluctant to take it, but uh, they said, well, it passed inspection and it should be all right. 800 feet above the sea, the mission turned deadly. The Green Hornet's two left engines cut out, and the plane and its crew crashed into the ocean 800 miles south of Hawaii. What were you thinking when you were seeing the ocean get closer and closer and you're spiraling down? Well, I've got to say that is the, the highest emotion of the human experience is going down in a plane knowing you're going to die. Uh, but uh, out of 11 men aboard the plane, three of us survived. And it seemed like forever getting to the surface. And on the way up, I'm swallowing oil, gasoline, blood. Um, and I got to the surface, I just threw up everything. And I saw the pilot and tail gunner hollering help. And then I saw a life raft drifting away from the wreckage area, which was vital for our survival. Louis reached the raft and picked up the other survivors, tail gunner Francis McNamara and pilot Russell Phillips. They were now floating in the middle of 65 million square miles of water. And that's when the tail gunner, after about 20 minutes, he panicked and screamed, you know, we're all going to die, we're going to die, and all that stuff. And, and I said, Mac, nobody's going to die. Settle back. And he kept screaming and screaming. And Did you believe that? Did you believe he'd be rescued? No, no, I, I believe we'd be rescued. We rescued people, especially when they know you're out of fuel. They're going to come out and look for you. The next day, they spotted a rescue plane. It's, it's weird. From the sky, a uh, 1,000 feet up, a uh, raft looks like a white cap, you know. And uh, 
No, they didn't see us. One week later, no more planes, and nature was taking its toll. The sun is your friend early in the morning when you're cold, and then it's brutal the rest of the day. Uh, and then at night you're cold. When you're on a life raft at sea, it's much worse than being in a foxhole. And they say there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. Well, you can multiply that a few times on a raft. That's all you do on a raft. Now, I don't care if you're an atheist or what you are. When you reach the end of your rope and you got nowhere else to turn, your atheism isn't going to help you. You're going to turn and look up. And so that's all we did on the raft was pray morning, noon, and night. And then uh, we had to start, you know, learning how to survive off of the ocean. There's some things that are not part of our food chain, but when you're starving, you eat it. Over the next three weeks, the men survived by killing albatross that landed on the raft and using it as bait to catch small fish. But soon that bait looked too good to waste. Eventually another albatross landed, and I told the guy, we've got to try to eat it. So in this one, we devoured it like, like a hot fudge sundae, you know, just delicious. They also survived on liver from small sharks they caught with their bare hands. While Louis drifted across the Pacific, in the U.S., President Roosevelt signed a death certificate for First Lieutenant Louis Samperini. According to the file, Louis was dead. After 27 days at sea, hope came alive. The men spotted an aircraft. They came down real low, far away, and they came in low right by us, and all of a sudden machine gun firing. My first thought, well, those, those are B-25, those are idiots. But those were not U.S. planes. It was the Japanese. You got the bullets coming out from above, and you got the sharks hungry below. <laughs> it was a bad situation. After a 30-minute assault, thinking Louie and his crew were dead, the Japanese left. Miraculously, none of the men were hit with a single bullet. But six days later, their 33rd day at sea, tail gunner McNamara died. Louie said a brief eulogy and slipped him into the sea. For two more weeks, Louie and pilot Russell Phillips drifted. Suddenly, they saw land, but their raft was spotted by the Japanese. They had spent 47 days in the South Pacific, drifting nearly 2,000 miles to the Marshall Islands before being rescued by the enemy. We were taken to the island of Woji and weighed in at 30 kilo, which is about 65 pounds. We still couldn't walk. We had to crawl. Within 48 hours, they were transferred to Kwajalein, Execution Island. I come from the vast Pacific, wide open, the sky wide open, now I open up my eyes, I'm in a little cell. Guards delighted in telling Louie about the previous U.S. Marines who visited the island. He said, well, they've all been executed by decapitation, samurai style. And he said, that's what they do to all prisoners that come here. The worst part, I think, about being in the cell was uh, submarines. A submarine came in, of course, they never see prisoners. So they can't wait so they line up in front of your cell, 75, 80 men lined up like going to a movie premiere, and every one of them is either swearing at you, uh, throwing rocks at you, jabbing you with sticks, spitting on you. You know, and here you are, 65 pounds, you got constant diarrhea, you're starved, they throw a rice ball, they don't give it to you, and it falls on the floor, you have to spend hours picking up every grain of rice mixed in with the dirt. And I, 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 it just seemed like that line would never end. And on three occasions, Louis was injected, used as a guinea pig for experiments. And I said, well, I'm getting dizzy. Ah, oh, they put down, you know, how much, how much time. And now I feel prickly spots all over my body. And then I said, uh, and now I'm gonna pass out. And then they stopped. But he made it off Execution Island alive. After 43 days of captivity, he and Phillips were sent to a POW camp in Japan. Then Louis was quickly sent to Amari. It was here where he met Matsuhiro Watanabe, AKA the bird. The bird was so relentless in his torture of the captives, Louis chose not to speak with us about it. Near the end of 1944, the Japanese took advantage of their famous prisoner star power. After an initial radio broadcast proving Louis was alive, 
he refused to read a second broadcast filled with Japanese propaganda. And I said, there's no way I can read this. Because of that, I'm sent to a slave labor camp. That camp was Naoetsu. I'm standing at a chance of watching the guard shack and the door opens and out steps the bird. So I knew what they did to me to get even because I refused to do the broadcast. And boy, that blew me. My knees buckled and I almost went down and then it started all over again and even worse. Louis was back under the control of the bird and the torture resumed. The war is over, peace has come. Americans celebrate as Americans have never celebrated before. September 1945, and Louis Zamperini was liberated. He arrived in the U.S. within the month. So the war's over. I'm alive, but now it's a whole new life. The American hero was busy being a celebrity, but found the time to fall in love with Cynthia Applewhite. He proposed 10 days after meeting her, but couldn't shake his demons. Now I got married, I have a little girl, and I'm still suffering nightmares, waking up uh, screaming, uh, strangling the, the bird. And one night I accidentally strangled my wife in my dreams, and she got scared. Doing some drinking too? Oh, well, that's all I did. I drank, uh, I just figured the more I drank, the, the, the better I'd sleep at night. So I was out every night drunk. My wife refused to go with me, and uh, she decided on a divorce, and had every right for a divorce. And then somebody had talked her into going to hear a, a new evangelist, a young evangelist called Billy Graham. I ask you tonight, are you prepared to meet God? Are you prepared to meet God the moment you die? His wife came to Christ at the crusade and had good news for Louis. She said, because of my conversion, Louis, I'm not going to get a divorce. Boy, I was happy. Then she and her newly found Christian friends were all over me and I avoided him like a plague. But he was desperate to save his marriage, so he reluctantly agreed to attend the next Billy Graham meeting. She talks about one person only, the person of Jesus Christ for 30 minutes. And, uh, you know, he read the scriptures, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is the eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, I knew I was a sinner, but I didn't like the idea of someone else reminding me, you know. Well, if anybody had ever asked me if I believed that Christ was the Son of God, I would have said, yes, all my life I believed it. But the heart, no, I never, I knew somehow if I believed it in my heart, my life would have been different. So I knew I didn't possess the Savior. And, uh, but I still didn't want to do it. And I think the best description of that is, the Bible says that men prefer darkness rather than light. And here I was preferring my rotten life to, to, to the light. And then I started having a flashback to the life raft and prison camp. All those thousands and thousands of prayers, God, spare my life through the war and I'll seek you and serve you. And I kept thinking, I came back from the war alive and I never even thought about those prayers. Never even tried to keep one prayer. That night, Louis gave his life to Jesus Christ. I got off of my knees Somehow I knew I was still getting drunk. I knew it. I also knew that I forgave all of my guards, including the bird. I knew it. And I think proof of that is I had nightmares every night about the bird since the war and after the war. And the night I made my decision for Christ, I haven't had a nightmare since. 1949 till now, and I did some kind of a miracle. And the young boy who grew up always wanting to get even came full circle in 1950. Louis traveled back to Japan to forgive the prison guards that tortured him. He couldn't meet with the bird, but spoke with many of the former guards. Some even accepted Christ as their savior. And in 1998, Louis again returned to Japan to run with the Olympic torch before the Winter Games in Nagano. I believe it with all my heart that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, for those who are called according to His purpose. Christ told us in the scriptures, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He that cometh to me, I will know I cast out. Christ is the way to God. He's the way, is the truth. People are always seeking truth. Well, the truth is Christ. And He's the life. But I think our eternal life starts now by faith in Jesus Christ. And so that is the strength we live by, and death no longer has a sting, not to the Christian.